I'm Guy Kawasaki, and this is Remarkable People. We're on a mission to make you remarkable. Helping me in this episode, and I've waited a long time for this episode, is one of my idols, Carol Dweck. Her book, Mindset, The New Psychology of Success, is one of the two most important books in my life. The other being Brenda Eulin's If You Want to Write. Carol is a professor of psychology at Stanford University. This interview was conducted in her office at the psychology department of Stanford. She has her PhD from Yale and a BA from Barnard College. Her work spans developmental psychology, social psychology, and personality psychology. She is focused on self-conceptions and their impact on behavior, motivation, achievement, and interpersonal dynamics. By the way, this is the first in-person interview since 2020. It took me two years to get on her calendar. Remarkable people like Carol are worth waiting for. I'm Guy Kawasaki. This is Remarkable People. And now, here is one of the guiding lights in my life, Carol Dweck. I don't know if you realize what an impact you had on my life. I do. When I read Growth Mindset, it was life-changing for me. So I would say that your book, and If You Want to Write by Brenda Eulin, are the two biggest books in my life. Fundamentally change my entire outlook and everything. I wanted people to know they had a choice. Yeah. We're all a mixture of both, of course, both mindsets, believing we can grow and improve, but also worrying that maybe it's fixed and we don't have enough. I made a choice at one point because I realized through my research, but also in my life, my sixth grade teacher seated us around the room in IQ order. I felt like she was sealing everyone's fate. And although I fared well in terms of my seating, it really pounded a fixed mindset into my head. And so even though I had always loved learning and always loved taking on new things, suddenly all I wanted to do was be smart and look smart and not take risks. And ultimately, this became a focus of my research the whole goal of my career was, this has been to help people fulfill their potential. I wanted them to know they had a choice. They could unlock that potential or they could worry about it and protect it. And I wanted them to go for it. And you discovered this at sixth? No. <laughs> I didn't discover it. I learned it in sixth grade. But then I discovered it in my research and with my students spelling it out as clearly and exhaustively as possible. Maybe you could give us a quick little update. Have you had any refinements or changes? So let me just talk a little bit about it. And then we, in our research, we saw some people favored more of a fixed mindset, the idea you have a certain amount of intelligence or any attribute, and that's it. That's who you are. You're lucky or you're unlucky, case closed. Other people tend more toward the belief, hey, you have abilities, but they're yep. capable of development, and you can grow them and expand them through taking on challenges and sticking to them by trying the strategies, by getting lots of input and help and mentorship. And we found over time that it made a big difference. People who had more or endorsed more of a growth mindset, they took on those challenges. They, they wanted to grow those abilities. Those in more of a fixed mindset saw so challenges as threatening. Maybe I'll be unmasked as an imposter. Maybe I'll find out I'm no good. Um, they also gave up quick, in a fixed mindset, they also gave up quickly because they saw mistakes and setbacks as meaning they didn't have ability. 
in a growth mindset, welcome to learning. There are mistakes, there are setbacks, and you mind them for what you can learn and how you can move forward more effectively. So that's kind of the basic idea. Again, in our research, we showed it predicted kind of some long-term, long-term outcomes. We developed short programs for students to change their mindset, and we saw it help them do better in school, especially the lower-achieving students, low-income students, students from underrepresented groups that they flourish more under the growth mindset. And then we, the first big thing we learned was that it's not that you have one mindset or the other. We fluctuate. We can be mostly in a growth mindset, but have a big setback. Whoa! Out comes that fixed mindset. Or social comparison. Oh my God, that is the scourge of our current civilization. Social media forces you to compare yourself to others, forces you to seek as many likes as possible. Whatever you put out there, you're on the line. Is anyone going to like it? How many people are going to like it? So that kind of, those kinds of experiences, even if we're mostly in a growth mindset, a lot of the time can trigger us into a fixed mindset. And we kind of have to find our way back. We have to kind of talk to that fixed mindset, say, thank you very much, I assure you, I know you're trying to protect me, but I'd like you to hop on board with my growth mindset plan. And over time, make friends with it, harness its energy, bring it along with you. Don't try to squelch it, that won't work. But the other really big thing we found is Mindsets are not a lone enterprise. It's not like you have your gross mindset and you take it with you when you are challenge-seeking and resilient. The environment you're in matters hugely. And this was brought to my attention by a former student, Mary Murphy, who's coming and professor now, has done a lot of work on this and is about to come out with a book, so I recommend her for your show. She's fantastic. Okay. Anyway, she said, marched into my office one day. We had an appointment, but she marched in and she said, you're treating mindsets as though they're just something inside someone's head and it's their responsibility to have a growth mindset. And, and I realized, and she said, what about the setting they're in? Can't the setting, the organization, the classroom... Can't that have a mindset too? And I said, whoa, you're right. Let's go for it. Let's do this research. And I also realized that teachers felt, many people have the same misunderstanding. Teachers felt, I'm going to give the students a growth mindset. I'll put a chart in front of the room. And then the, they should act like growth mindset people or organizations felt. Tell our people to have a growth mindset. Teach them what it is. Then it's their job to have the growth mindset. No, it has to be supported by the beliefs, the philosophies, the practices and policies in the culture. So imagine a teacher teaches growth mindset, puts up a chart, wants students to have it, but that teacher's practices could embody a fixed mindset, like my teacher, Mrs. Wilson, who seated us around the room in IQ order. What could convey more a fixed mindset? And she assigned all the responsible tasks based on IQ. And so fixed mindset, not just large, but huge. So teachers needed practices where on the first day of school, they say, I believe all of you can learn to a high level. And here's what I'm going to do. I want everyone to raise their, anyone to raise their hand as soon as they're confused. Let's work it out. That's valuable for me, too, as a teacher to know what I'm not getting across. Every time you do homework, I will give you feedback. And we will work through what you didn't understand. When you take a test, 
I'll allow you to take it again later and get some credit back because I know you can learn to a high level. I want students to work together and mentor each other till everyone gets to a high level. So organizations too. The idea that everyone has something valuable to contribute and everyone is capable of growth. To see that in action is amazing. But again, the policies are about developing, not just choosing the high potential people and giving them the opportunities. It's about committing resources to everyone. So I'll just give an example. I went to give a talk at a large, old financial organization. I expected it to be very buttoned up and stodgy. No, the opposite. I walk in, the man at the door waves my book mindset at me. Professor Dweck, we're so <laughs> glad you're here. I go to sign in, the person at the sign-up desk. Professor Dweck, we can't wait for your talk. It wasn't just for the financial bigwig. There were sign-up sheets in the lobby for exciting projects. Anyone could sign up. You could be the person who fixes the boiler. And you were invited to sign up and be on any of these projects. So the whole environment was about you can develop, you can be more. We don't label you based on your present job. We work with you to be the person that you can be. So that was the second big thing. First, the you can get triggered into a different mindset. And then that the environment is big. It's not just growth mindset people. It's growth mindset environments that allow you to use that mindset effectively. Are you saying that the fixed mindset can occur chronologically or when you're young, you have a certain mindset. When you get older, it changes. Or you're saying that you could be fixed mindset about, let's say, academic subjects, but growth mindset about hobbies. I think I'm saying the latter. First, you can have different mindsets for different At the same time. areas. Yeah. I can think my intellectual ability could grow forever, and I'm always working on it. But my... I'm, and I'm just making this up, my athletic abilities, <laughs> it's fixed. I mean, or my artistic ability is fixed. You can have a different mindset for each ability area or even about your personality. Some people think, hey, I am who I am. I don't like a lot of it, but, you know, I'm doomed. Or, wait. I'm capable of growth. I'm capable of learning new ways of being. And by the way, researchers are now finding that teaching the growth mindset about personality is making a dent in depression and anxiety in adolescence. So you can have it for any, any area fixed or growth mindset. In addition, I'm saying, hey, situations, no matter what your favorite mindset is, say mine is a growth mindset, some situations can flip me, at least temporarily, into a fixed mindset. If they're super evaluative and I'm struggling, I feel judged, I'm, I, I, I have doubts about those abilities and whether they can develop. I think one of the points that maybe many people don't quite understand is that it, it's almost like a oh, fixed mindset is a negative. So the people who have it are losers. But you're also saying that you could be a MacArthur Award winner in mathematics and you have a fixed mindset at an extreme that would mean, well, I'll never try surfing because mm -hmm. I'm only good at math. Mm -hmm. I'm going to maintain that self image. Yeah. And I'm not going to try anything that's going to make me look like a jackass. Yeah. But so winners can have fixed mindsets they too. They can. They can. If you think it's fixed and I have infinite amounts of it, I'm smarter than anyone else, 
that could serve you for a while. For a long time, you can win awards. You can be feverishly pursuing those awards and pursue them successfully. But I feel like, first of all, it's not as enjoyable because you're, you're easily threatened and you have to keep competing and beating everybody else as opposed to enjoying your own progress and learning. And then at some point when the younger people are coming up and they're the ace new mathematicians in these emerging and crazy new fields, you're threatened rather than saying, wow, let me get into that. Let me find out about that. And uh, j just kind of welcoming these new times of growth. And just getting back to organizations, the opposite of a growth mindset organization is what Mary Murphy and I called culture of genius. It's a fixed mindset organization. Who's the genius? And we found in our research that in these cultures of genius, people cheat. They steal each other's ideas. They cut corners. It's a dog-eat-dog. -dog. And that often is to the detriment of the organization. You think Apple under Steve Jobs was a culture of genius? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You certainly can't fault Tim Cook for what he has done post-Steve, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a culture of genius there now. No, and it took a long time for me to believe that, but I, I do believe it. And where we really got interested in growth mindset and its implications. Oh. I want to tell you some. Were you going to say no, something? Go ahead. I just wanted to tell you. Are you watching the NBA playoffs? The National Basketball. No. Why? Three of the four final teams are growth mindset teams. Seriously? Yeah. Like you consulted to them? I haven't directly consulted. No, but they've talked publicly about adopting growth mindset principles and applying them. And do they understand you're the center of the universe? I love it. They even say my name. What? <laughs> really? Yeah. It's very exciting for me. I am a sports fan. Are the Warriors one of them? The Warriors were eliminated in the last Oh, round. I didn't even know. But yeah. What? But okay, sadly, but sadly, sadly. Even though they're eliminated, were they a growth mindset? Yeah, team? yeah very much so. Mm -hmm. You would assume that with Steve Kerr. Yes. Huh. Forget all the big corporations. That's... <laughs>
what are the ways of announcing your belief in everyone's potential, your beliefs that everyone can make a really good contribution to the company and maybe the world? What, what are your mechanisms for getting the, their ideas? How are the managers mentoring each and every one of their charges? And how are the employees coming back and mentoring the manager? How are the employees mentoring each other? Okay. What are projects people are offered that show faith in their potential to grow? Collaboration and teams get the credit, not individuals. Okay, so we talked about teachers, talked about CEOs. What about parents? Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really worried because now we hear so much about helicopter parents who do everything for the kids, and, and these kids are suffering. They're doing more poorly in hard courses like STEM. They're having mental health problems. So what are these parents communicating when they do everything for the child? They build the child's science project. They write the child's college essay. Or they employ a team to massage the child's resume. C communicating to the child, you can't do it on your own. I don't trust you to be the person that I could be proud of. The person who will get into the top schools and become the top X, Y, or Z. So. What a parent does to give that child confidence and the growth mindset that goes with it is to support the child in their learning. Keep it the child's job to learn. Kids love learning. They're born taking on challenges. They get such a thrill from mastering something. Capitalize on that. When they do get frustrated, we call it scaffolding. Build a scaffold to the next thing. Hey, what do you think you should do now? Do you think you might try one of these? And the, the child takes it over again and then tries it. You think it could be the blue one or the red? You're narrowing it down. You're helping them on that road to learning. But they own it. Let them try hard things, help them master, but keep the learning their own. And similarly in school, you can be a resource. Don't do it for them. Okay, so very tactical question. Is there a role or what is the proper role for tutoring for a student? Sure. Tutor, and there are great tutors. So a tutor is also someone who supports the child's learning helps them to understand and like the parent I was just describing focuses on the process of learning the understanding not just getting the right answer not just rushing the child to the correct solution but really enjoying and the expert tutors that have been studied in research like the research of my former colleague Mark Lepper They don't even look like they're teaching. They're doing a lot of talking to the kid. They're joking around. They're making it fun. They're asking questions they almost never give in. They're asking questions. And then the student is figuring it out based on this support, based on this question asking, based on this fun situation. Yes, there's a role for tutors, but not the kind where A parent hires five tutors so the kid <laughs> can get a hundred on every test and, and get into a top school, even though they're now five years old. <laughs> so no, not that kind of tutoring, but that kind of supportive tutoring that helps a child love a subject and learn a subject. For employees or for kids. Do extrinsic awards, do extrinsic rewards mm -hmm. positively re reinforce the growth mindset or is it perverting it? 
positive, uh, concrete or extrinsic rewards like paying for grades or giving someone a treat if they've done a puzzle or whatever. Uh, research suggests that it dampens the child's interest and enthusiasm for the task. Gee, as the story goes, if they have to pay me to do this, it must not be very interesting. In the classic research, we give awards to kids for doing a puzzle. And then afterwards, they weren't done into puzzles as, as the other kids in the study. So never say never. <laughs> but, but try to heighten the intrinsic. So maybe the extrinsic yeah. has a place if a kid hates a subject or hates doing something, but they should be weaned off that as it becomes, as you make it more enjoyable for them. Okay. Is there a sequence in the sense of you have a growth mindset, you're successful, that reinforces the growth mindset, or are you successful? You get a growth mindset, so you get more success. Is there a chicken and egg question here? It, I think it could go either way. You can start with a growth mindset and feel rewarded by the progress and feel that your growth mindset is reinforced and you set the next big goal for yourself. Or and you can do things that you didn't think you could do and you go, whoa, I didn't realize I could grow my abilities. What, what happens when there may be systemic issues that, you know, people try the growth mindset, but because of the rigidity of how scores are kept or whatever, mm -hmm. they cannot succeed. Yes. Then what happens? Like yes. The growth mindset failed them? I don't want to put, you're so right. I don't want to put all the responsibility inside the person. Yeah. There are structures, there are hurdles, there are there can be unfairness in hiring practices and admissions policies. You could get on you could be discriminated against, get discriminated against or you could be unlucky. So, yeah, it's a misinterpretation of a growth mindset to say that's all you need. And then there are no excuses for why you couldn't rise to the top. But a growth mindset also orients you toward looking for opportunities. People with more of a growth mindset take on mentors, seek out mentors, seek out learning opportunities, figure out where to be, where to go. And in that way, enhance the likelihood that they can use their growth mindset successfully. I'll show you my bias before I ask you the question. Oh, good. <laughs> so I think chat GPT is an absolute game changer and will foster growth mindset because it, it is the ultimate patient, infinitely wise research assistant, as opposed to write the essay for me. I don't believe in that path. I do believe in the research assistant path. So I just want to know what your opinion is of does chat GPT cripple you or empower you? It could be both. As chat GPT, we've only begun to see its enormous potential. And so we could be frightened and maybe we should be by write the paper for me because they can write a great paper. It or it. I don't know. Is it an it or a they? It can write a, a great paper. I saw a talk last early this week where a professor asked ChatGPT to outline his talk. And it outlined it just like the talk he gave. It was an amazing outline. He asked it to design an experiment on a certain topic. It designed a terrific experiment. I thought, wait a minute. That's the assignment I give to my class. I don't <laughs> want them going to chat GPT <laughs> to have it design the experiment. So there's a, a lot of potential and even 
the inventor is now asking for limits to be placed on it. At the same time, we're doing a project with my former student, David Yeager, of using ChatGPT to do growth mindset tutoring and growth mindset advising. So right now, or at least a few months ago, things change rapidly. Students would go to a chat GPT type advisor, an online advisor, and say, oh, I don't know if I'm college material. I'm kind of depressed. I'm not sure I should. And it might say, not everyone's college material. Do something else you're comfortable with. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think someone should be counseled out at that point. <laughs> Whereas gross mindset inspired materials are being developed that say, hey, a lot of people feel this way. Tell me why you're feeling this way. And then it supports an exploration of different paths the student can take and encouragement to try to take a path of challenge and growth. So, and, and also in tutoring, ChatGPT probably already understands the different kinds of mistakes students uh -huh. sure. are making sure. and exactly what they need to know to surmount those mistakes. That could be incredible that everyone will have this expert private tutor. So the possibilities, the up, upsides and downsides are really tremendous. Conceptually, is it possible that someone has too much of a growth mindset? I, it could be, I don't want to blame the growth mindset for it, but it could be that people feel they have to be learning everything all the time. A growth mindset also would make a person feel they should never give up. But I, never, I don't say that. Sometimes you're wasting your time. Sometimes, because a growth mindset doesn't promise you that where you'll end up or how much ability you will end up having. It's just the idea that everyone can develop and we never know where we're going to get with it. So a person always has to do a cost-benefit analysis. Am I making progress? If not, how can I enhance that progress? If I'm losing my job and my family is starving because I'm not giving this up, maybe I should put it on hold for a while. So... You've got to be kind of reasonable about it. And asking the flip question, are there times where a fixed mindset is a good thing? So you can give up on something saying, it's not yielding to my efforts now. You don't have to say, develop a fixed mindset that I can't ever develop these abilities, but you can decide to give up and apply your growth mindset somewhere else for the time being. I also, I give my students, I teach a course every fall with a, a freshman seminar, it's called, and it is on the topic of mindsets. And I ask them, if a fixed mindset is a liability, why has it survived? Yeah. Why is it so common? Yeah, and? And... Oh, they come up with a lot of good reasons. First, it gives you a sense of who you are. I am good at this. I'm not good at that. I like okay. this. I don't like that. I'm interested in this. I'm not interested in that. I grant you that. It tells you what to expect from other people. That's a bad person. I must say, that's a smart person. Blah, 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 blah. So it, it, creates this false sense of certainty, this anchoring of who you are and what to expect in your world. But aren't you saying that those kind of shortcuts or proxies can be useful? 
not as a whole way of life. Okay. Not as I can do this, I can't do that. Not that you've decided prematurely who you are and who you will always be or who someone else is and who they will always be. Because you're a sports fan, how does Carol Dweck interpret Michael Jordan trying to switch to baseball? You know, I thought about that the other night when I watched the movie Air. I watched Air too. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I loved it. I, oh, yeah. It really was something. And then I, when it came to the part where he was swinging the bat. Yeah. <laughs> I said, like, what do I make of that? First of all, I really celebrate that he went for it. That was brave. He was at the top of the pyramid in basketball. And he said, you know, I also loved baseball. I could have gone either way. I don't know what I make of the fact that he didn't make it, even though he gave it his all. Some people thought, oh, maybe. He was older and he didn't have the habits ingrained. I'm not sure how to understand that he couldn't advance very well toward another point in his career. But I love that he came back to basketball and did amazing things despite his age. Yep. Do you know the Japanese concept ikigai? I have heard of it. Essentially, it's your reason for living, the reason why you wake up. And, and whenever they talk about Ikigai, they always show some guy bent over a hot furnace making samurai swords for the last 50 years. Yeah. And his whole life is making the best sword ever. My question is, do you think that a growth mindset should lead you to your Ikigai? That finding your Ikigai is the goal? Or is Ikigai the end of your growth mindset? That's the best question anyone has ever asked me. Up next on Remarkable People. The answer is yes. I think every single person has the capacity for a really meaningful contribution. Become a little more remarkable with each episode of Remarkable People. It's found on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. You're listening to Remarkable People with Guy Kawasaki. Every year I reread my book Mindset with my seminar, a chapter a week, and I still like it. <laughs> I laugh in the right places. I cry in the right places. I still enjoy it. But. In the last year or two, I have realized the book tells you to have a growth mindset and to succeed and inspires you in ways of mm -hmm. succeeding. I believe. <laughs> But then I said, succeeding in what? And I don't take a stand in mindset on what you should or could strive for. And so I am now contemplating a book in which I do take the reader to the meaning of their life, to the thing that they, I don't know if I should say were meant to do, the thing that will give meaning to their lives and will be their contribution and kind of integrated with growth mindset. I don't know how I'm going to do it. It feels really hard, but it's the <laughs> only book that I want to write next. I cannot wait for that book. So do you think that you, you mean at the end of the growth mindset, you find this icky guy or this icky Carol and that's it? No, no. It's then you apply your growth mindset to what you love doing and, and you apply it to becoming the person you want to become and making the contribution you really value 
You should do it. And you should use ChatGPT as your ah. assistant. <laughs> no, okay. No bullshit. Okay, Carol. Like, I'm an author. You're an author. So I can, you know. Yeah. So I really believe in having a lot of examples in my books. One of the things I say about the remarkable mindset is that there's cases where people stick with something, Jane Goodall, at age six to 93. Yeah. There's also cases of people completely switching. Yeah. And at one point, I'm tired of writing about Jeff Bezos going from banker to bookseller and all the yeah, usual, yeah. all the usual, yeah. especially because like now he's with his $500 million yacht and his second wife and all that. I just can't, you know, relate to all that I shit. I read about the yacht this morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so I asked ChatGPT, give me examples of successful people who make big career changes. Yeah. And it comes up with an example that is both well-known person. I never heard this story before. And I consider myself quite... You're the expert on this. I don't know about yeah. that. But, and so let me tell you a story. Julia Child, until she was in her mid-30s, worked for the CIA. Mm. She was a spook. Mm. She married another spook. They moved to France. She got exposed to French cooking. And that's why Julia Child is Julia Child. Wow. Okay. You didn't know that? I knew she moved to France with her husband, but I didn't realize they were spies. Yeah, they were spies. <laughs> so I would have never found that story without ChatGPT. Now, I will also tell you that I don't believe everything ChatGPT says it so, could be repeating something yeah. someone said that was wrong. So, so I had Madison GPT make sure that that story is true. And it is. But I think that is an example of... A huh? good use of it. Of oh, Chat absolutely. GPT. Yes. Absolutely. Advice taken. <laughs> oh, I, I, can I give you one more piece of oh, advice? Yes. Okay, so I have... There's all kinds of things to help you write. And there's two kinds of writing. One is write me the essay, right? There's also, you put your paragraph in and it checks for grammar, gives you ideas, gives you synonyms, et cetera, et cetera, changes passive voice to active voice. I don't consider that cheating. I consider that a very good editor would have done that too. Mm. And so I use something called Quillbot, Q-U-I-L-L-B-O-T. And I put paragraphs in and it gives me a choice of like simple, long, short, strong, fluent, casual. Mm. And I get like six choices. Mm. And then I take one of them, I put it in, and then I alter it again to my taste. But when you have writer's block, I, I always have writer's block. I will write a recommendation. Mm -hmm. I'll write an example. I'll write how to do it, three, four techniques. Mm -hmm. And then the last part before the next section is where I struggle. Like, how do I summarize all that into two or three sentences? Yeah. So I take my best shot and I put it into Quillbot and I swear to God, girl, it just gives <laughs> me great stuff. <laughs> wow. It, I think chat GPT and Quillbot in particular for me definitely makes people better writers. There's mm. no question in my mind. And and these people who are afraid of it, which I can understand, but no, there's also, you read every day, you know, I went to chat GPT and I asked it if Steve Jobs graduated from college and it said he did and I know he didn't. Those kinds of things. Got right? you. The got you. Mm -hmm. That's like saying, I got on the first car and it's nowhere near as good as my horse and buggy. <laughs> <laughs> right now, thank God we're not in Florida or Texas, but can you just address what's going to happen to teachers' mindsets, because you are a teacher, when all of a sudden politicians are telling you that these are the books you can and cannot use, these are the movies you can and cannot show, this is the curriculum restrictions. What's going to happen there? Ooh, I don't think I'm going to go there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's an answer in itself. <laughs> all right. Let's say that you are now the Dean of Admissions of Stanford. Mm -hmm. What criteria does Carol Dweck use to admit kids to Stanford? So, I think I've already influenced them. Yeah? It used 
you, as you know, in the old days, it was the grades and the test scores. And now it's more, oh, or, or you went to Europe and wrote a poem and <laughs> kayaked or something. <laughs> but it has really changed toward creating a really interesting student body of kids who want to make a contribution, who kids who have taken on challenges, who have overcome adversity, and a kind of gross mindset leaning students with a social awareness and a desire to participate in a diverse, challenging, and opportunity-filled environment. And how does a junior in high school communicate a growth mindset to Stanford? In their essays <laughs> and in the activities they've undertaken. I teach a, a seminar, I mentioned a, a freshman seminar every fall, 16 students, 16 freshmen. They meet me on their first day of school. I've done this for now 17 years. And the students have gotten more and more interesting, more, yeah, more and more different from each other. But they've all done great things, either in the school that they came from, in the town that they came from. They all want to do great things. It's really exciting. So you're not going to say, oh, they're br just brilliant in, <laughs> in a standard way. I always say, they are so interesting. Does Carol Dweck, the teacher, give letter grades or do you just praise their effort? Praising effort has been overdone. I do praise progress. Okay. Not just effort. Okay. Yeah. I do praise progress. But I do take them on a journey over the course of the quarter. I have them do outrageously growth mindset things, things they'd never consider doing, but the person they want to be would do. Like what? So that's one of the assignments. I want you to, this week, I want you to do something outrageously growth mindset, as I said. They do amazing things. There was, for example, a few years back, there was this young man, painfully shy, and he realized he was sitting in his room, letting all these opportunities go by and making no friends. For the assignment, he decided to run for president of his dorm. <laughs> and he won. <laughs> That's but great. before he got up to give his winning speech, he said, I could still sit down. Nobody would know. But then what would I write for my paper? Because he had, they had to write a paper about it to hand in on Monday. So he got up and gave the speech and he won. And he became the center of social life in the dorm. And then started doing all kinds of other outrageous things. Carol, my head is exploding a little bit. When I was a freshman at Stanford, just luck of the draw, I get assigned Carol Dweck for my freshman seminar. I'm one of 16 people. The arc of my life would have changed even earlier. I hope those kids realize how lucky, to use a basketball analogy, it was like I showed up one day for this course and Michael Jordan was the coach. I have to tell you, I'm the lucky one because I have seen these students flourish like you wouldn't believe. And I get letters from them for years about the unbelievable things they've accomplished. So I just feel so rewarded yeah. by that. Is there a Carol Dweck Hall of Fame of growth mindset where you say, this person personifies the growth mindset. This is a role model. I... I don't want to single out someone. Okay. I just, I you know what, that. I'm going to, 
distort your question okay. into the question I want to answer. The answer is, yes, I think every single person has the capacity for a really meaningful contribution. And yeah, I don't want to single out one person that people might or might not identify with. I just want to say, you can be one of those people and I want to play a role in helping people get there. And specifically, like, I'm listening, not I, yeah, theoretical I in the web, on the web is listening to this. Okay, so now what, Carol? Okay, I believe. My next book. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, give us a little bit. No, no, I did tell you a little bit before. Okay. okay. I'll leave it at that because it's still in formation. When is this book coming out? After it's written. Yeah. Okay. But as I said, mindset told people, tried to give people a growth mindset so they could pursue anything more effectively. And now I want to take them to their meaningful contribution. Does that mean you have to go on a limb and make value judgment? No, no, no. That those are things I have to work out. But it's it's up. To, yeah, mm, mm, I'll stop there. I mean, that's a tricky question because then you're really you're playing with content. I mean, you're playing with. No, I'm not telling them what's worthwhile. Yeah, I'm helping them to find what's worthwhile to them. What if the CEO of Goldman Sachs is creating enormous wealth is worthwhile? I'll have to deal with that. <laughs> Maybe he'll end our chair. <laughs> I'm writing this book called Remarkable Mindset, which is a ripoff of your word. Oh, mindset. you're welcome to it. <laughs> the first chapter is an homage to you, basically. Oh, God. <laughs> In fact, the first sentence of the first chapter is Carol Dweck dented my universe. Because the subtitle of the book is Remarkable Mindset, How to Dent the Universe Using Growth, Grit, and Grace. Mm -hmm. So your growth. And you may find it slightly weird, but I start my book with the story of seeing you at Chris Webster's funeral. Oh, why? We obviously shared this chauffeur. And he took many, many rich, famous venture capitalists, captains of industry, moguls, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And on that Sunday afternoon, the only person I recognized was you. And I thought of the hundreds of people that he waited for hours at the airport, that he woke up at 4 a.m., <laughs> that he picked up at midnight. <laughs> only you were there. And I was so impressed by that, Carol, that that stayed with me forever. So believe it or not, yes, that's how I opened my book. I hope you don't mind me using the M word. Not at all. Okay. The M word is and, fine. And at, at a very tactical level, is it conceivable? Am I, am I barking up the wrong tree? I think there is a pattern where you can have a remarkable mindset. Mm-hmm which requires the growth mindset mm -hmm. in it. But so that's the premise of the book. And if, Great. You know, if you tell me I'm full of shit, then I need to know. <laughs> no, I think it's exciting. I think it's exciting to see the growth mindset form a pattern with other things that, that help people become remarkable or ex express and grow their remarkableness. That's all I got. You got any more Carol Dweckisms no, that you want to? No, it's been such a pleasure talking with you. And I can't wait to read your book. I'm so grateful to Carol for sharing her expertise and experiences with us in this episode. I hope it has inspired you to embrace the growth mindset, explore your own self conceptions, and seek continuous improvement in your life. Remember, your potential is, well, I don't know if it's unlimited, but it's probably greater than you might think. But you have to believe in the power of growth and resilience.
I'm Guy Kawasaki. This is Remarkable People. I believe in the power of Peg Fitzpatrick, Jeff C., Shannon Hernandez, Luis Magana, Alexis Nishimura, and Madison Nismer. They are the Remarkable People team. Until next time, mahalo and aloha. This is Remarkable People.